Hi, this is John Eldridge, and welcome to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. What we are doing over this series is exploring the personality of Jesus from my new book, Beautiful Outlaw. There is absolutely no one and nothing that is more captivating than Jesus when you can see him as he really is. And to know Jesus as he really is, is to fall in love with him. And so what we're doing in this series, I am reading some excerpts from a new book called Beautiful Outlaw, discovering the playful, extravagant, disruptive personality of Jesus, which comes out this October. And so let's explore Jesus together. Picture cattle and sheep running for their lives, crashing down the corrals, their hooves sliding frantically on the tiles, making them even more desperate. We have a stampede here. It then says he poured out the coins of the money changers and sent their tables tumbling. The money changers, think men who make their living through extortion, are reported to have been sitting at those tables. Now, How easy is it to move carefully and quickly from a sitting position while removing your legs from the table that is being overturned in front of you? More panic. Meanwhile, the coins. Jesus doesn't permit them to gather their money and move off in an orderly fashion. He dumps the coins, scatters them. This is explosive. You've probably had a small handful of change fall off a counter. They burst in every direction like a jar of marbles. Imagine the chaos of hundreds and hundreds of coins erupting off the stone floors. Now, layer all this together. The animals would have panicked in every direction, their keepers running after them, shouting, trying to get control, which only incinerates the panic. Add the greedy money changers scrambling around on the ground, grasping at their careening coins. Imagine the noise bellowing of frightened livestock mingled with the crashing of corrals, tables, coins, and the angry shouts of the incensed men. And over this, the shouts of Jesus. It is absolute pandemonium. Someone screaming fire in a casino would not be far from the reality. This is a fierce, intentional man, to be sure. But his passions are neither reckless nor momentary. In the midst of the fury, there is this touching tenderness toward the doves. They were in cages. If Christ were to hurl them to the floor as he did the tables, the birds, innocent as, well, doves, they would be hurt. So he commands them to be removed. Now, could a small, unintimidating figure accomplish such a sustained riot? To pull off Driving all of them out of the temple would require more than a few seconds and repeated blows. This is a sustained assault. If a frail man with a meek voice tried this, he'd be log-jammed by the sheer numbers and inertia of the traffic. Jesus is a locomotive, a juggernaut. For all practical purposes here, he is the bull in the china shop. This is our Jesus. But is this the Jesus of our worship songs? The religious fog sneaks in to obscure Jesus with lines comparing him to a rose trampled on the ground. Helpless, lovely Jesus. Vegetarian, pacifist, tranquil. Oh, wait, that was Gandhi, not Jesus. Can you picture Gandhi or Buddha? storming into the polling place of a local election, shouting, overturning tables, sending the participants fleeing. Now throw a small carnival into the mix, which they also need to rout. Impossible. Whoever did this would have to be really committed to clear the building, fierce and intentional. This is a breathtaking quality, especially when compared to our present age, where doubt masquerades as humility, passivity cloaks as rest, 
and emasculated indecision poses as laid-back enlightenment. Oh, Jesus could be soft, and he certainly was humble, but his fierce intentionality is riveting to watch. Look at him before Lazarus's tomb. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. From John chapter 11. This expression, deeply moved in spirit and troubled, seems unhelpfully vague. I'm deeply moved when someone remembers my birthday. An Oxford Don who loses his notes is troubled. We're not even close to the true nature of his mood yet. The root of the Greek word here means to snort in anger, like a war horse. Peterson, therefore, translates it, a deep anger welled up within him. Ah, yes, that's better. Of course it did. This is the prince of life, who came that we might have life. What do you suppose his personal attitude is toward death? And here, the death of a close friend? I hate death. I think I hate it more than anything else in all the world. Jesus has mighty strong feelings about it, too. Deeply moved doesn't mean someone had to catch his arm and help him toward the casket. Jesus overcome with sorrow. Something fierce is rising up in him. A second round of this war horse anger wells up. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But, Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there for days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Oh, to have heard this command, heard the mightiness in his voice. John uses the word loud to describe it. He uses this very same word to describe the ferocity of a storm that nearly sank their boat. Apparently, Jesus' command here reminded John of the intensity of a storm. Jesus doesn't ask Lazarus to come out. He doesn't suggest he do. He commands him to life with the rumble of thunder and the crack of lightning. Obediently, Lazarus comes hopping out like a mummy. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Jesus finishes his business here with the very businesslike order to take off the grave clothes and let him go, like a hostage negotiator who has just freed a victim. Chesterton conducted something of a personal experiment to see what the overall impression would be if a person simply read the Gospels without any previous information regarding Jesus. And what he found surprised him. It is full of sudden gestures evidently significant, except we hardly know what they signify, of enigmatic silences of ironical replies. The outbreaks of wrath, like storms above our atmosphere, do not seem to break out exactly where we should expect them, but to follow some higher weather chart of their own. Oh, but they do make sense when you understand that this is a man on a mission, that the same man who could be so playful is also a man on fire. If you would know Jesus, you must know that this, his fierce intentionality, is essential to his personality.
nature bears witness. Picture an African lion stalking through tall grass, closing in on its prey. The ruthless focus, the vigilant keenness, or the gaze of a silverback gorilla when he turns to confront an intruder crossing the hidden boundary of his band. How about a mother brown bear when her cubs are threatened? Six hundred pounds of unrelenting fury. Now imagine that you are watching one of these scenes, not on the nature channel, but from thirty feet away. Oh, yes, we find a very fierce intentionality in nature reflecting the personality of the artist. Knowing this, delighting in this, helps us delight in his highly provocative actions regarding the Sabbath. There is nothing like arrogant religious falsehood to arouse this part of Jesus. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. And then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. The synagogue ruler said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for eighteen long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated. But the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. From Luke chapter 13. There is nothing so suffocating as religious legalism. Here, in the one place this woman can hope for freedom, she is denied for 18 years. Jesus is disgusted with it. He publicly humiliates the defenders of this sanctified bondage. His action isn't exactly going to ingratiate him with the authorities. I doubt very much willing to publicly humiliate Pharisees is on any requirement list for pastoral candidates. I doubt it ought to be. This sort of thing takes a rare holiness to accomplish righteously. But the people are cheering, and well they should. And then there is the story of subduing the storm that I referred to earlier, and immediately after, the encounter with Legion. In all three synoptic gospels, these two stories are linked, a frightening storm and then a frightening demoniac. In all three accounts, Jesus, who was sleeping in the stern of the sinking boat, rises to confront the tempest like a drill sergeant. Quiet! Be still! Now, why does he need to rebuke the storm? The word, epitomio, is the same used when Jesus commands foul spirits to come out of people. Fascinating. The storm needed to be rebuked. The very next episode in all three synoptics finds Christ stepping on shore to confront Legion. He frees the man, the locals rage against Jesus, and he gets right back in the boat and returns to the other side. Did he go to all that effort for one man? It ended up that way. And Jesus did say something about leaving the ninety-nine to find the one. It certainly is an awe-inspiring doubleheader, and fearsome, too. That is, Jesus is fearsome. Everything else trembles before him. And then he turns towards Jerusalem, turns toward the walled city like a general, turning his forces into the hottest part of a battle. A few honest Pharisees, Nicodemus perhaps, warn him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. Jesus replies, go tell that fox. I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. From Luke 13. 
This man will not be intimidated, will not be deterred. It certainly sets his rebuke of Peter when he tried to dissuade Jesus within its context, words that otherwise feel cutting and unnecessarily cruel. Yes, there is a leisureliness to Jesus. He'll stop whatever he's doing to attend to someone in need. The man never, ever seems to be in a hurry. But his manner can be appreciated only in light of a deeper river flowing in him, this fierce intentionality. Otherwise, you get those popular and ridiculous portraits of Jesus as the wandering storyteller, no more controversial or dangerous than a clerk in a health food store. The life of Jesus went as swift and straight as a thunderbolt, wrote Chesterton, almost in the manner of a military march, certainly in the manner of the quest of a hero moving to his achievement or his doom. And in the most beautiful turn of events, the hunted becomes the hunter indeed. As Jesus crucified descends into hell personally to demand the keys from Satan, what was that journey like? Far more than a twilight walk to a cottage, he faces a creature way more terrifying than anything you've met in your nightmares and makes him bend the knee. And then Jesus simply turns and walks back out again, leading a train of rescued captives with him, only to race off and catch up with two disciples limping down a road toward a town called Emmaus. The most human face of all. Now, all of this can begin to sound so lofty and noble that it ends up having an effect opposite from the one that he intended. We begin to lose Jesus. He's already starting to drift back again heavenward into the rafters to take his place in the stained glass. For something has crept into our assumptions about Jesus that makes it almost impossible to relate to him, not to mention love him. I say crept because it has not been a conscious decision, few of the things that shape our actual convictions are. I think much of the creep has happened, ironically, as a result of our attempts to love and revere Christ. But crept in this notion has, and it has done great damage to our perceptions of him, our experience of him. It's the notion that Jesus was really pretending when he presented himself as a man. We who worship Jesus Christ hold fast to the belief that he was God, very God of very God, as the Nicene Creed states. The heroic actions and miraculous powers of Jesus' life attest to it. So, when we read what we would call the more human moments, we feel that Jesus was sort of cheating. With a nod and a wink, we know what's really happening is that Einstein has dropped in to take the first grade math quiz. Mozart is playing a measure in the kindergarten song flute choir. After all, we're talking about Jesus here. The guy walked on water, raised Lazarus from the dead. He never broke a sweat, right? But then what do you make of that terrible sweat in Gethsemane? They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father. He said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Deeply distressed, overwhelmed with sorrow, anguished. This doesn't sound like somebody cheating to me. He begs his father with tears that this awful cup might be taken from him. Please, let there be some other way. He doesn't want to do it. Sweat like blood pouring from his tormented brow. He pleads with his father, and then he pleads a second time, and then a third. 
Does this sound like Einstein adding two and two? Gethsemane was the most terrible farce if Jesus was faking it. He was human. Really. You recall the famous story of his trial in the wilderness? Well, at the end of those 40 days of fasting, it says he was hungry. On his way into Jerusalem one morning, he goes to have a look at a fig tree because he was hungry. Many readers recall the encounter Jesus had with a woman at a well. The account says that Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Wait, Jesus was hungry? Tired? Thirsty? Yep, that's what it says. He was human. The Gospels are filled with beautiful and haunting descriptions of the humanity of Jesus. One of the most poignant takes place when the report reaches him that his cousin John has been guillotined. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for them and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here, on a platter, the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it, and then they went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. From Matthew 14. Jesus takes the boat, leaves the crowd behind, and sails to some place he can be alone. The man who has unceasingly offered himself to others needs to get away. He needs room to grieve just as you would. I cannot say this more emphatically. Life affected Jesus. We have spread so many ashes over the historical Jesus that we scarcely feel the glow of his presence anymore, lamented Brennan Manning. He is a man in a way that we have forgotten men can be. Truthful, blunt, emotional, non-manipulative, sensitive, compassionate. Jesus never did anything half-heartedly. When he embraced our humanity, he didn't pull a fast one by making a show of it. He embraced it so fully and totally that he was able to die. God can't die, but Jesus did. It will do your heart good to discover that Jesus shares in your humanity. He was, as the creeds insist, fully human. Now, yes, yes, more than that to be sure, but never less than that. I'm sure the chipmunks made him laugh. The Pharisees sure made him furious. He felt joy, weakness, sorrow. The more we can grasp his humanity, the more we will find him someone we can approach, know, love, trust, and adore. Let me assure you, I cling to the Nicene Creed and the Orthodox faith held by the church for ages. Jesus was somehow God and man. A number of ridiculous books have been released in the last hundred years arguing that Jesus was merely a man. But a reaction in the other extreme is wrong as well. He is not Mozart playing with the kindergartners. We're not going to parse here the technicalities that theologians have used to try and explain the mechanics of how he became human yet remained God the Son. To try and dissect that now misses the point. Our little brains seem to be able to hold only one or two thoughts before us anyway. Right now we're trying to recover his genuine humanity. Notice how the religious fog, even at this moment, is working to prevent you. This is disrespectful. Maybe heresy. He's pushing his point too far. But now Jesus is ascended, so none of this matters. Friends, the more the dog barks, the closer you are to the bone. Jesus was tired, hungry, 
thirsty because he took on our humanity. You've been listening to an excerpt from my new book, Beautiful Outlaw, which comes out on October 12th. And we are so excited to tell people about this Jesus, that we've got special offers for you. If you order a copy before October 12th or on October 12th, we want to send you a free second copy that you can give away to a friend because we want to share this with the world. And we've got all kinds of other things, a beautiful book trailer that you can email around to your friends or post on your Facebook site and some free videos and actually some live events coming up. For more information, come to beautifuloutlaw.net.